good afternoon. Welcome to Solution Spotlight, uh, where we talk about some of the most innovative strategists shaping the future of cybersecurity leadership. And today I am joined by Lee Parrish, CISO of Newell Brands and author of a recently published book, The Shortest Hour. Thanks for joining today, Lee. Oh, not at all. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, well, to start us off, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your leadership philosophy when it comes to building cybersecurity programs throughout your career and now at Newell Brands. Certainly. I've been I've been uh, doing this for about 23, 24 years now. And um, I think if there's one consistent theme across all of the, the companies I've worked for and the strategies that I've built, uh, it's been a focus, a hyper focus on the people, uh, the people aspect of of the cybersecurity program. So, one thing I, I mention a lot to people, and I mention it in the book as well, is um, you know, as CISOs, we all have um, the same access to technology as every other CISO. There's, there's the security vendors are not selling to some of us and not others. I mean, we're all on a level playing field. And when it comes to processes and policy and things like that, again, we're all on the same, uh, same, you know, uh, landscape. There, there's nobody has an edge in that area. We have access to research firms, analysts, uh, frameworks, um, cybersecurity frameworks, all, all kinds of things. We can get policy templates. Um, so again, we're on an equal equal playing field. The true differentiator in a cybersecurity program then lies in its people. And as a result of that, I spend a lot of time uh, selecting the right people, selecting uh, people who are curious and, and people who uh, like to dive into um, unintended use cases for technology and things like that, people who are curious. And then once they're on board, um, you know, just supporting them as best as I can. You know, it's uh, all about, um, you know, making sure they're engaged, they're doing the work that they are, that they find challenging and not just looking at a screen all day uh, and just being nice, you know. So uh, that's what I've been doing consistently over my career. Um, and, you know, that always resonates with me as a recovering consultant where we focus so much on people processing technology. And I'm a huge advocate that people are are kind of truly the the long pole in that tent. Um, you know, in the companies that you've worked with or the organizations that you advise, obviously the budget and the sophistication of some of those enterprises can be very different. And so when it comes to selecting people, you know, how do you, how do you, what's that consistent thread that you have maybe leveraged throughout that journey to focus on the people? Because I'm sure there have been organizations where you have unlimited operating budget to actually spend on salaries and you can kind of build the best or buy the best, but then what happens when you're just looking for that curiosity and fostering them? And Or is it a balance between the two and it's been that way no matter what organization you've supported? Yeah, I think there's all, there's always a, a challenge in, in bringing on um, new new folks, I, you know, getting the budget and things like that for small to mid-cap companies. Um, you know, maybe the budget's not there for, for large enterprises. They're certainly not just an open checkbook, but, you know, they, they're certainly, uh, they scrutinize uh, the spend as well. So uh, what you want to do is make sure that w when you do get the funding for that, you fill that chair with the most um, uh, optimal resource that you can find. And, and I know yeah, there's debates in, in social media and professional networks where they say, you know, there's a um, there's a shortage of cybersecurity experts, or some say no, there's there's not as you know, there's all kinds of people applying for cybersecurity jobs. Um, what I've seen in in my career and recently in the last ten years is the the resumes that come across my desk are usually people who have one to three years of experience, and so um, if a CISO has a strategy to fill, let's say. 15 roles in their cybersecurity program. And their their strategy is, I want to fill these with people who have eight to 10 years of experience. That may not be realistic, not, not in today's environment, uh, unless you're willing to pay over market for those those folks and, and have them work remote 100% of the time, pay them an uh, exorbitant amount of money above comp, uh, you know, comp ranges. You're not going to find those people. So what I've done is... I see the team with, you know, three, four cybersecurity experts, people who have that, um, 
that level of experience. And then the rest of the team I fill with people who are maybe maybe they don't have a lot of experience in cybersecurity. Maybe they don't have any um, experience in cybersecurity. Maybe they came from IT or something like that. Um, but it's all about you know professionalism, their the per, the personality. Um, you know, that curiosity is something that I, I continually look for in people. People who are willing to engage and build relationships is important to me. Um, you know, we're an extension of the business. We enable the business. So as a result, we have to work with the business. And if if we have people who who are resistant to building relationships and, and just want to work, you know, um, kind of off on their own, that typically doesn't work too well. So... I um I look for people who have you know high personalities, uh, very curious about things, um, and they inject into the team. You know the the experts will provide them um, experience and and lessons learned from a career of of doing this, but the young um, newly um, new in their career, uh, cybersecurity people. Uh, they can challenge, you know, what has been done before and ask questions. Well, why, why do we do it that way? You know, and it kind of in the middle there brings out a lot of, of good innovation. So that's what I found. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most operative words that I just picked up on that you said is the idea of having a strategy to begin with. And I know from yeah. personal experience, I've worked with a number of colleagues and companies where, the, the strategy is more just, you know, we have this many openings and let's fill them as quickly as possible. And there hasn't been that thought put into, is it a, a team of eight to 10 years of experience with a high salary cap? Or is it something that we're going to kind of round out with, with smaller ones? What do you think, um, I guess maybe my first question is like, why is it so hard for us as an industry to kind of like wrap our heads around that strategy? Um, Rick Howard and I call it kind of like the money ball approach, um, right? If you're like building a team, you have to sort of think about the constraints of the budget you have, and then what are you going to build? And how do you think about those positions and those players before you actually start putting people on the ground? Um, but why has that been so hard for us? And my second kind of corollary to that is, what are some of your recommendations to, you know, your peers and those coming up in the field to maybe integrate that into more of their own program development strategies across cybersecurity? Yeah, I think, you know, it is a challenge. I, th I think that a lot of times, um, uh, I think it's much better now than it was in the past. In the past, um, most of, uh, I will say many of the security leadership uh, were comprised of um, people who were very technical and didn't have um, a, a lot of business acumen. And, you know, they were uh, hands on keyboard. And when the need arise, or when the need arose for um, someone to take a CISO role, the logical uh, selection was somebody who's been involved in it. And that usually was a technical person. Um, uh, you know, even then, people understood what business was, they understood finance, and maybe could they could even read a balance sheet or, or things like that. But uh, when I talk about business skills, I'm talking at the same level as your peer leaders. So the same level of experience in finance and strategy and operations as as your peer uh, executives would have, not just a, a, a glancing understanding of business, but a deep seated um, uh, expertise, not expertise, a, a deep seated uh, knowledge of, of finance and all of those other business domains is critical. So I think that that kind of was the, the issue before. Um, I, I think a lot of times as CISOs, we, we jump into something, we're given budget and we're saying, okay, what do we want to do? And let's go, go forward and build this. Um, that's not the time to actually think about that. You should be thinking about that before you get the money and before you even start talking to vendors or before you even do an interview. Um, the, the analogy that I use quite a bit is um, when you go into a car, car dealership uh, to purchase a car, you don't walk on the lot and say, show me everything. I want to see SUVs. I want to see electric cars. I want to see compact cars. I want to see sports cars. I want to see electric vehicles. No, you already have an understanding of some of the models that you want to see. And you probably have an understanding of the price range you're, you're probably going to pay. It's the same thing for cybersecurity. You should already know what it is that you want, who you're going to talk to, and kind of sort of know how much you're going to pay. As far as the people aspect 
goes, I would say one of the things that I like to do is to, to make a quad chart. And in the top right corner would be things that we have we absolutely need in our cybersecurity uh, program from a from an expertise perspective um, and then it also means at that level uh, where we have gaps so for instance if we need um, threat intelligence let's say we have a high need for threat intelligence in our organization and currently on our team we don't have any resources that have that level of, of threat intelligence that falls in that top right corner but in the bottom left corner uh, if, if it's if it's a nice to have kind of skill that we're looking for and we already have people that have that I'm not going to focus on on hiring those for those roles I'm going to prioritize on the roles where uh, we have a gap in the skill set uh, on our current team and we have a high need for that skill so that's that's kind of the way that I've done it and then I meet with before I even give the strategy to the um, CEO what I'll do is I'll go to each of the individual leaders. Like I'll go to the CFO and talk about budget and I'll go to the uh, CIO and I'll talk about technology and I'll talk about how the security solutions I'm proposing may interoperate with, with what's already uh, in the environment. And for the chief HR officer, I, I talk about that strategy of skill set gaps versus what we need. Um, you know, what level of expertise we're looking for, um, geographically, where are we going to place those individuals that makes sense in the overall program? It's like a chess match. You know, you just want to make sure that the whole strategy fits together. And you don't want to have um, people on the team that have all the same skill sets. Like you, you don't want a bunch of people who are really good at threat intelligence and then they, they don't understand uh, other domains within cybersecurity. So it, it really is a chess match. Yeah, well, and it really hits on another theme that obviously is part of what you implement in your own leadership roles, but also is in your book that is, I know, geared towards independent directors, but probably just as helpful for um, existing CISOs. And it's that kind of theme concept around security relationship management. How do you build a relationship with your peer executives, other stakeholders in the organizations, and, you know, what your examples just really illustrated how important that is, but that must, that takes a lot of time and effort. Um, can you walk through what, like maybe some, you know, examples or stories of just like how you kind of learn to navigate those waters and maybe some things that you've learned that have helped uh, grease the skids when it comes to that relationship right. building and management as you then build and execute on your cybersecurity program? Yeah, it started whenever I first got into um, cybersecurity. So this was this was back in the late '90s, early 2000. Um, I uh, was awarded a position as a CISO at a at a company, and uh, I was very excited. And so I, I reached out to peers in in the area um, who were CISOs, and I, I was trying to garner some information on some tips and best practices and things like that that I could incorporate into my new role. And there was there was one person who was very nice and set up a day worth of uh, discussions and things like that. So I went uh, to uh, his office and uh, introduced myself and he, we started talking about the role of, of the CISO and how it's so important. And um, we, we walked around the office and we ran into the vice president of corporate security, so f the physical security, yeah. and he, he introduced me to to that vice president, and we talked for a minute about how important cybersecurity was. And then my host said, um, "Actually, I don't think we've ever met in person. You know, my name's so and so, and you know, I was I was kind of taken aback a little bit. And then we we met the CFO. Same thing happened. It was we we've not met. My name is so and so." And I, I thought to myself, how can somebody be effective in this role and not have a strong relationship? Right. Now, it's it, it's gotten a lot better over the years. This this was, you know, 20, 23 years ago, 24 years ago. But um, uh, it, it planted a seed in me. And, and I thought to myself, you know, if I'm if I'm going to do this and do it right, I need to build relationships across the business. And so at that time, I said, I'm going to go and get an MBA. Uh, degree. And whenever I was telling my friends about it, they asked, oh, well, are you getting out of security? And I said, no, I'm getting an MBA so I can do security better. And, you know, I need to speak the vernacular. I need to understand what's important to them. Uh, so that's, that's, that was the, 
the initial seeds that that started, and then over time it culminated in uh, to a, a very structured program uh, that I call security relationship management, and that is tracking my relationships across uh, the company and externally as well um, to make sure that I'm nurturing those relationships and I'm giving them the time that they need uh, to be effective. Um, you know, we spend so much time uh, with relationship building and. and personal in our personal lives, we don't tend to track those too much. I mean, with our spouses and our partners and our, our children and, you know, members at church or you know, our pets, even, you know, you don't really need to track a lot of that stuff. It's just, you know, natural. But as you move into the corporate world, uh, and there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of different relationships, if you're not tracking those and, and understanding, um, the key stakeholders and the interactions that you have with those folks, um, you're not going to be successful. So that's that's kind of the uh, genesis of security relationship management. Yeah, it's an incredible story. And I can speak firsthand. I've spent a lot of time kind of brokering, um, I'd say the translation role between kind of security leaders and then HR in particular when it comes to people and how to identify those priorities, everything else. And it definitely requires a level of nuance. Um, and I don't think it's only the responsibility of those of us who are on the security side. I think that there's kind of that executive responsibility for all those other stakeholders in an organization to kind of think about how security impacts what they do as well. Um, and I and I say that to pivot into um, what inspired you to write this book? Because if, you know, I have it correct, the the really the the shortest hour is meant to help inform new directors on boards to understand how they can actually, you know, conduct and not only ask the right questions as they execute cybersecurity oversight, but also understand enough to make, you know, some real actionable decisions out of that um, and evaluate where things are. So can you talk to me a little bit about what, you know, what inspired you and what are some of the things that you hope directors who have an opportunity to read this take away from it? Yeah, absolutely. I was I was blessed very early on in my career, uh, where I was surrounded by leaders who were very engaging, and they wanted me to participate, and they gave me invitations uh, to participate. I realized that a lot of listeners who are CISOs may not have that same level of um, support, uh, and and they have to fight their way. And so I, I do realize that I was very blessed early on. And throughout my career, I, again, I've been, I've been extremely uh, blessed and every company I've worked for, there was an opportunity for me to present to senior leaders and to the board of directors and to committees as well. Um, uh, in an uh, unfiltered way to be able to explain risk and, and not be, um, toned down by by leaders and things. Well, don't say that, you know, they, they were very open. So that's the baseline. I mean, if you don't have that, the game is over. Um, but very early on, I, I was interacting with some very, very serious people uh, on on different boards. So it was, um, you know, retired admirals and generals from the military, it was um, CEOs of fortune 10 and fortune 100 companies, not an intimidating bunch uh, at all. Not at all. And there was a, there was um, a, a White House chief of staff, a U.S. presidential candidate, all of these different folks in my very first time working with the board. So I learned very quickly, and um, uh, it, it was it was really nice to be able to have that experience. And then as I moved throughout my career, I, I had experiences with working with the board, not just in a presentation format, but actually like one on one to be able to. Uh, fly to a location and meet with a new director who's coming on board and um, uh, giving them an overview of the cybersecurity program and what to expect. Um, I've been asked to assist in special projects uh, for uh, the board uh, that required a lot of confidentiality and things like that. I've been able to work very uh, closely with the, the chairpersons of the committees in which I've reported to. So um, access and then that deep relationship has really helped. And so, um, you know, about three years ago, two and a half years ago, I, I was thinking, you know, it would be nice to kind of give back to the industry and kind of talk about um, my experiences with working with boards, as well as I, I've seen um, 
a um, opportunity with how boards are providing oversight uh, to cybersecurity programs specifically. It's a systemic risk. Um, it always falls on either number one or number two on the enterprise risk management programs for every company I've been a part of and certainly yeah. probably for the ones of your listeners. And, um, and then I looked at my experiences, and I know they vary because of surveys and things like that, and other other CISOs may say, no, I, I, I speak for an hour every, you know, month. Uh, others will say, no, I don't speak at all except for one supplemental um, presentation I put yeah. in the, the documentation. So I, I just kind of took an average and I said, well, it's about 15 minutes then. If it's, if it's 15 minutes a quarter speaking to the audit committee or the technology committee or something like that, and there's four quarters in a year, that's an hour. So that's the shortest hour. As I, I believe that one hour a year is not enough time to talk about something as critical as cybersecurity. Um, and so I started writing. And uh, as I was writing, the SEC proposed some regulations about disclosure. And um, I thought, wow, this is really timing out to be really good because that's what I'm talking about. And um, uh, December of last year, I finished the book, uh, was... Uh, published by Taylor and Francis uh, with uh, CRC Press and uh, went through the editing process and it just launched last week. So um, it's it's been a, a great journey. I really enjoyed uh, doing it and uh, hopefully people will enjoy it and uh, and provide good feedback. Um, you know, you brought up the SEC, so I, I have to ask, um, and I am notorious for going off of my own script. So I apologize in advance, Lee. But, you know, what is, you know, having been um, in these roles for the majority of your career and seeing what the SEC is coming out with as far as disclosure, um, you know, of material breaches, of which there's a lot of questions around what that definition of materiality really is. Um, but then that coupled with, you know, annual filings and the requirement to kind of report on the maturity of cybersecurity programs. Where do you fall on the spectrum of, you know, is this good for us as an industry? Is this hampering because it's putting too much, you know, handcuffs or potentially scapegoating those of us that are in, been in cybersecurity and trying to, you know, be right all of the time when it's impossible? Um, what's your take? Yeah. I think, um, you know, we, there's always been some level of disclosure about cybersecurity. Um, usually it's in the, the risk section yeah. of of the uh, 10K. And, and, and there's a little bit of a blurb about cybersecurity and the availability of systems and the, the uh, uh, capability to deliver services and products to customers um, and the risk of, a, of, a, um, of an attack, cyber attack. But the SEC... Um, their regulations were more specific of to disclosing, um, you know, the the different uh, more more details than we've ever seen before. And so the analogy that I use uh, in the book is when I was in the eighth grade, uh, I took a math class and um, we were taking just general arithmetic and, and things like that. And then we got into fractions and division and things like that about halfway through the year and we would turn in our homework. So we would do our homework and we turn it in the answers and uh, we get our homework back graded. Uh, about halfway through the year, we started getting into algebra, you know, pre-algebra and things like that. And so the teacher, uh, I'll never forget her. She, I, I could still see her face. Uh, she said, okay, for your homework now, I want you to start showing your work. And of course, everybody groans and they're like, oh gosh, you know. So now it was not just enough to give the answer. You had to give you had to show how you came to that answer. And I think the SEC regulations are, show me your work. You know, it's it's no longer enough to just say you have it. Show me how how you have it. Um, with that said, I think it's a it's a positive step in the right direction. Um, there there were some you know regulations that were dropped, some were enhanced um, and edited. Uh, but uh, I think it's a it's a good step in the right direction. Uh, I think because it's a a new regulation, uh, we're always going to see things uh, out of the gate uh, where we have issues with trying to define materiality. I think corporations have structured programs to determine what is material and what is not. But as it relates to cybersecurity, I, th I still think there's some work to do. I think there's some ambiguity around what a reasonable shareholder is. Is that me with you know buying 10 bucks worth of a stock right. or is it War warren buffett you know who is a reasonable yeah. stakeholder stakeholder um but i think those will get 
straightened out. Um, we're already seeing that. Some people initially disclosed something and the SEC provided comments and stuff. So yeah. we're working together as an industry. I think it's a very positive step. Uh, I think it could be better. Though. And to bring it full circle to where we started in your concept of relationship management, all the more reason to not only look at the CFO and the head of physical security and head of HR, but also your head of legal. <laughs> We're putting together oh, these yeah, filings. That's... I mean, that should be a non-starter anyway. Like that should be a given. Yeah. But you know, if you didn't have a, a reason yeah. to do it before, you certainly do now. Yeah, one of my deepest relationships uh, across the board at every company I've worked for has been with General Counsel. Uh, even even my current company is just a wonderful relationship. You're you're talking a lot. You're uh, you're sharing ideas. Um, you 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 really need that. That's the one relationship that I, I think is has been most beneficial for me in my my 10 years as CISO. Well, Lee, thank you so much for taking some time to share some of your experiences with us, as well as some of the nuggets out of your newly published book. So congratulations on getting that out there. Um, it's really been a, a, an amazing thing to, to read as I've started to delve into it. And um, for those who have not had a chance, Lee, I'll let you give one last plug. Where can someone go get a copy, their hands on a copy of The Shortest Hour? Yeah, so it's available to all the favorite booksellers, you know, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. You can go to Taylor & Francis, Rutledge, you know, it's it's all over the place. Um, but thank you uh, for the support. I really, really appreciate it. Great. Thank you.